next, uh, Dr. Julian Koenig, who is going to tell you more about what we are doing in IMB. <laughs> Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I, first of all, I would like to welcome you also all to today's uh, seminar. Uh, and I would like to thank Rene and Dorothy for joining us to, to uh, giving their talks. Uh, and uh, importantly, I would also like to thank Mariella who is uh, organizing and taking the initiative at IMB to, uh, to join the RNA collaborative seminar series. So yeah, the Institute of uh, Molecular Biology, I just want to very briefly introduce you, uh, is located in Germany and Mainz. And uh, next slide. It was funded uh, in 2011 uh, as a Center for Excellence in Life Science. And it's funded um, on the one hand by the Böhringer Ingelheim Foundation and uh, also by the state of Rhineland Palatinate. And uh, we have around uh, eight, uh, uh, around 12 uh, groups at IMB and five adjunct groups of which three uh, are our scientific uh, directors. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the research focus at IMB uh, lies on aging and disease and uh, for molecular mechanisms, we are very much interested uh, in DNA repair and also in gene regulation. And uh, for gene regulation, a lot of groups at IMB are interested uh, in RNA biology and mechanisms of RNA regulation. And uh, this is also why, we, of course, why uh, we are all here today uh, to learn more about uh, this topic. And uh, yeah, next slide. Uh, with this, I would like to hand back to uh, Mariella uh, yeah, yep. to introduce the talks. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Julian. Uh, yeah, I'm, we are very happy to start with this uh, first talk from uh, our very recently joined um, uh, new adjunct director, uh, Professor Dorothy Dorman, and, and she um, has been before um, doing a lot of research in Germany, in especially in Munich, uh, and we are uh, happy also to have her now um, in the Mainz community, um, and, and she's interested in general in, in the uh, how the RNA, um, how the proteins uh, that are um, influencing neurodegeneration by the different process of, of uh, accumulation. And today she's going to talk us about um, this uh, regulation of the RNA um, binding proteins in neurodegeneration. And we are happy to hear uh, more about this. Uh, so uh, please, Dorothy, uh, um, uh, you, you can share your slides. I will stop my sharing. Okay. Thanks very much, Mariella and Julian, for um, the invitation to speak here and uh, giving me the chance to present uh, our research to the RNA community. Um, so I hope you can see my screen. I'll put on the full screen mode now. Um, yeah, so as Mariella already said, our research focus is really on neurodegeneration linked RNA binding proteins. Uh, in particular, we focus on these two disorders, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and frontotemporal dementia. So these are two related disorders and one common uh, yeah, pathological hallmark of these diseases is that RNA binding proteins get mislocalized and aggregated in the affected brain regions. So in ALS, it's the spinal cord and uh, patients eventually develop uh, motor neuron, they develop motor neuron generation leading eventually to severe muscle weakness and paralysis. And in frontotemporal dementia, it's the frontal and temporal cortex that is affected, um, then leading to severe behavioral abnormalities or language dysfunction. And so in either the spinal cord or this frontal and temporal cortex, you have aggregates of either the RNA binding protein TDP43 or FAS. So the majority of patients have these TDP aggregates whereas a smaller number of patients have FAS aggregates. And a common um, um, yeah, hallmark is that 
these proteins, they actually are ubiquitously expressed, uh, I should mention. So in all cells of our body, you have them not only in the brain or in these brain regions, but in, in all cell types. Um, so they're normally found in the cell nucleus, and there they're involved in crucial aspects of RNA processing, like splicing regulation, uh, also microRNA processing or regulation of transcription. Um, but in the affected degenerating brain regions of these patients, they are more or less lost from the nucleus and they're found in the cytoplasmic aggregates. And my group really tries to understand how this mislocalization and RNA binding protein aggregation uh, arises. So we study um, yeah, the individual molecular steps that lead to this um, pathological um, aggregation and would like to understand it on the molecular level so that we can come up uh, potentially in the future with some therapeutic approaches, how this could be prevented or how their normal physiological localization and function could be restored. And so we are really focusing on understanding yeah, the, the, the protein shuttling uh, as well as aggregation process. So what you'll be hearing about in most of my talk is really on the, on the protein level, on the RNA, RBP level, and not so much on the RNA side of things, but I nevertheless hope that it will, you, you will find this interesting and some of the concepts that we have found, I think, can also be applied, uh, transferred to other RNA binding proteins. So just before I uh, show you some of our research, I'd like to sort of summarize up front sort of the major type of mechanisms that we and other researchers in the field have found over the last years. So we think that one first crucial um, step in this pathological cascade are nuclear import defects. And I'll talk about this in a bit more in, in a minute. Um, so um, the nuclear import of these proteins seems to be disturbed, leading to their cytosolic accumulation or elevated cytosolic levels of these proteins. Um, and then what then happens is that um, when cytosolic levels, TDP or FOS, are increased, they have a higher tendency to accumulate in cytosolic RNA granules, such as stress granules or other RMP granules by the mechanism of liquid-liquid phase separation. And then in these highly concentrated, um, in these, uh, through these high local concentrations, they can then undergo a liquid to solid state transition and aggregation. And this is sort of at least the working model in the field at the moment. And um, a third aspect that we are also studying very actively and what can also um, play a role in pathogenesis is post altered post-translation modifications. And, and this is what I'll um, be also be talking about today in my talk. So um, basically, yeah, we already know about these um, uh, major molecular mechanisms that play a role in this pathological relocalization aggregation but we would like to understand this um, in, in, in greater detail, hoping that we can find ways to intervene in this pathological cascade, as I said. So I'd like to um, start by um, showing you how we got interested in uh, nuclear transport of these proteins and uh, their pathological um, phase separation. So uh, already in my postdoctoral work, I found that um, Nuclear import um, is an important uh, mechanism that is disturbed in these diseases. So it turns out that um, there are disease-causing mutations in the nuclear localization signal, FUS, um, which disturb binding of FUS to its nuclear import receptors. So just as a reminder um, what these nuclear import receptors do. So um, nuclear import receptors or impotents, as they're also called, they bind to uh, cargo proteins via a nuclear localization signal and then import these cargos through the nuclear, uh, through the nuclear pore complex into the nucleus. And FUS utilizes an import receptor called transportin or TNPO1, which binds to its C-terminal nuclear localization signal. And turns out that there are ALS causing genetic mutations, which cause yeah, familial form of the disease. Um, which sort of disrupt this NLS, alter its sequence so that transportin can no longer bind or binds with reduced affinity. And so this um, uh, you basically find to a different degree. So there are some like, weak mutations which only reduce transportin binding weakly. 
or as others, like for example, this proline to leucine mutation, um, disrupt transportin binding very severely. Um, and so you have a severe cytosolic accumulation of the protein, and this correlates with a, a very severe um, disease progression and early onset. So patients that have such dramatic um, NLS mutations, they already get the disease at, a, at an unusually young age. So usually, I forgot to mention ALS and FDD are late onset diseases that usually start around 50 to 60 years of age, but um, it can have a very early or even juvenile uh, onset if you have a very severe um, NLS mutation that very strongly disrupts nuclear import of FUS. Um, so having shown this and that nuclear import uh, defects of FUS can cause ALS, um, we uh, went on and sort of wanted to understand what then actually causes aggregation of FUS. So once the protein is relocalized into, this, into, this, into the cytoplasm, what then makes it cluster in, into, in the, into, into some yeah, cytosolic assemblies or aggregates. And so um, for, the, for this, we observed that cellular stress and the formation of stress granules can, could be a, an important uh, initiating mechanism. So this is, um, again, some, some, some old data that I'm just summarizing here. So we found that when you have an NLS mutation, for example, this P5-P5L mutation, and then you stress cells, with any stress that elicits stress granules, such as heat shock, that then the cytosolically mislocalized FUS protein, and the same actually goes true for TDP43, that then the proteins cluster heavily in stress granules. And so um, based on this, we proposed that um, formation of stress granule could be a, a mechanism that initiates a higher local or yeah, causes a higher local concentration of these uh, aggregation prone RNA binding proteins and that these uh, RNP granules could potentially be precursors to the pathological aggregates. And that was supported by findings from um, uh, collaborating neuropathologists who stained um, the Mortem tissue of these ALS and FDD patients with um, um, markers of stress granules, for example, the poly A binding protein or TR1 and others. And sure enough, they did find um, some of these stress granule marker proteins co localized with FUS or TDP inclusions, supporting the idea that stress granules could um, yeah, be um, important precursors to the pathological aggregates. Now, of course, I was uh, in no way in uh, sort of proof of this uh, of this this hypothesis, but um, it um, it was a, a first hypothesis that got a lot of support uh, in the following years with the realization that stress granules like uh, other membranous organelles um, um, are formed through the process of liquid liquid phase separation. Um, so this is just illustrated here in this very um, basic cartoon. Um, them illustrating a lot of uh, the, the known membraneless organelles in the cells. And so you, you see that stress granules um, belong to this um, family of non membrane bound organelles or membraneless organelles, as they're also called, um, that form through weak multivalent interactions of RNA binding proteins and RNAs, um, giving rise to these yeah, liquid like dynamic granules. And um, so, what was observed through very basic biophysical experiments is that such liquid-like granules can actually solidify and transition um, uh, into a solid state, undergoing a so-called liquid to solid state transition and give rise to fibril or aggregates. So um, this has been, um, I mean, this is even known for a long, long time for non-biological molecules like water, which can exist also in these different phases. And yeah, in the last decade or so, it's been realized that this holds also true for many biomolecules, including especially RNA binding proteins and RNAs. And um, such um, liquid phase separation of FAS has been for the first time reconstituted by the labs of Stephen Alberti and Tony Hyman in 2015. They showed that FAS can form these liquid like granules in vitro and that they can actually give rise to, uh, yeah, FUS aggregates in the test tube um, over time in, in a so-called in vitro aging experiment. And so um, they also showed that 
This is highly concentration dependent, so higher con concentrations of these RNA binding proteins very much promote this liquid phase separation of FAS and the liquid to solid state transition. And so that sort of nicely fit our model that when you have a high local concentration of these proteins, for example, in stress granules, that there such a liquid to solid state transition could, could arise. And so um, since sort of, yeah, so since this realization, we, this is basically the working model in the, in the field um, that um, in such membraneless organelles like stress granules, such liquid to solid state transitions give rise to these pathological aggregates. And we are now very interested in finding regulators of this process. So molecular mechanisms that um, yeah, basically influence this phase separation of FAS and its liquid to solid state transition. And uh, interestingly, one of the um, regulators we have found a couple of years ago is transportin, so the nuclear import receptor that I talked to you about earlier. So um, um, I already showed you this. Um, Cartoon, what transportin is sort of known to, normally known to do, that it acts as a nuclear import receptor for FAS. And so we had studied molecular interactions of transportin with FAS in great detail. And based on this, um, we have come up with a hypothesis that um, basically look, when we looked at a, at a disorder um, order plot, like a, with some prediction programs, we noticed that the sequence that transportin binds to is highly disordered. So this NLS sequence, which consists of a, a PY NLS and an RGG motif, you can see that it's, it's very disordered and it's mostly the disordered regions that promote phase separation of these RNA binding proteins. And so um, based on this observation, we speculated that transportin um, could uh, by binding to these RGG regions could modulate FAS phase separation. And so this is what we uh, then went on to, to demonstrate. So we took um, purified FAS protein, either full length or uh, various mutant forms. So we made a deletion mutant where that lacks the C-terminal NLS and also a mutant version where we mutated all arginines in RGG motifs to lysine and show that these the deletion mutant or also the mutant basically uh, phase separates very poorly, showing that they are important drivers of FAS phase separation. So FAS phase separation is to a large extent driven by um, these arginines and RGG motifs. Um, and we could then show um, first using in vitro experiments and, and also following uh, cellular experiments that transportin um, can by binding to FAS, these FAS RGG motifs can now very powerfully suppress FAS phase separation. So this is just a simple test tube experiment that illustrates this. So you see how FAS and the physiological, um, physiological buffer conditions form these liquid-like droplets and over time sort of solidifies. And in the presence of equimolar amounts of purified transportin, this actually is uh, completely prevented. But um, other control proteins that we added in that also bind to FAS RGG motifs, for example, or other impotents don't do this. And so we think that um, transportin has a special ability to uh, weakly interact with multiple regions of FAS, and this is how it so powerfully chaperones FAS. This is also true um, in, in cellular assays. So we came up with several essays that allowed us to show that mm, transportin also suppresses stress granule association or stress granule recruitment of FAS. So this is a simple assay in semi-permeabilized uh, HeLa cells that had been stressed before and therefore have stress granules. And then when we add recombinant FAS, um, they will, it will bind to stress granules, so stained here with a stress granule marker. And when we um, not only add FAS, but FAS together with transportin, this is completely suppressed. And also in, in some assays with intact cells that I'm not showing uh, for time reasons, we could show that transportin also in cells can act as a chaperone of um, uh, FAS and, and sort of keep it soluble in the cytoplasm and prevent its stress granule recruitment. Now, this is all of this is disrupted by disease-linked mutations. Um, like the mutations I, I showed you before that weaken transportin binding, like not surprisingly, there's not only, um, these mutations not only 
have a sort of a negative um, impact on a nuclear import of fuss, but also on this chaperoning function of transportin, as illustrated here uh, in these, uh, with these data. So um, the wild type protein is, um, as you see here, um, strongly uh, completely chaperoned by, trans by transportin. But when we purify a mutant version of FAS with such an ALS uh, causing point mutation, which weakens transportin binding, this chaperoning is uh, yeah, basically uh, abrogated and, and this mutant protein cannot be chaperoned by transportin because transportin cannot bind properly. And so therefore you have in, in cells, um, so this is a, an assay in, in, in intact HeLa cells, where we compared uh, stress granule recruitment of cytosolically mislocalized um, FAS versus uh, a mutant version that has this NLS point mutation. And it shows that also here, the NLS mutant protein, because of its poor transportin binding ability, has a much higher tendency to accumulate in stress granules. Um, and so um, basically we, uh, yeah, made the surprising finding that nuclear import receptors not only um, are, an important, are important uh, for the nuclear import of certain cargo proteins, um, but also they can have uh, very important chaperoning functions and sort of keep proteins uh, soluble, dispersed in the cytoplasm and can prevent their stress granule recruitment and aggregation. And this is not only true for FAS and transportin, but it has been, uh, this concept has been broadened. And so in parallel to our study, the lab of Jim Shorter has shown that also other aggregation prone disease linked RNA binding proteins like TDP43 or EWS and TUF15 and HNRPA family um, proteins are chaperoned in the same way um, and even can be disaggregated by um, the cognate impotence. So this is a, a paper published back to back with ours and also the lab of human chuk has made a similar finding. Um, and this concept uh, even uh, seems to apply for other classes of proteins like older in vitro data from the, the girl in Lemke lab has shown that ribosomal proteins and histones and nuclear porins can be chaperoned by impotins in vitro. So for this there is so far no cellular data but it um, suggested a broader class of um, proteins sort of related to DNA RNA uh, metabolism that tend to aggregate in the cytoplasm uh, have to be chaperoned by this class of proteins. And more recently, we have shown this um, in collaborative work with other labs. We've shown this also for, um, um, for a number of other RNA binding proteins with RGG motifs. So these RGG motifs tend to especially uh, often, often drive uh, RNA binding protein phase separation. And we think that especially these need to be sort of chaperoned in some way uh, to suppress phase separation of these proteins in the cytoplasm. Um, now, interestingly, there are important defects um, that have been um, described in, in uh, certain diseases. So in certain forms of ALS and FTD, we have um, a transportin uh, or important alpha mislocalization and aggregation. And even in premature aging syndromes, transportin dysfunction has been recorded. So we think that um, when these factors become somehow dysfunctional or rate limiting or the levels drop below certain critical levels that this could be a trigger for uh, pathological aggregation of certain um, relevant RNA binding proteins. And um, so it's an yeah, interesting sort of yeah, concept or also maybe something that potentially could explain tissue specific um, aggregation of certain proteins. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I wanna um, switch gears to the post-translational modifications, as I mentioned in the beginning. Um, and um, tell you a bit of our, our interest um, in these very powerful regulators of these RNA binding proteins. So um, if you look on phosphocyte.org, it's a very useful website for looking up uh, PTMs that have been found in, for example, high throughput studies. You see that um, there are many different PTMs um, reported on FAS and TDP. And we are very interested in them because it turns out that they can 
um, very often regulate um, phase separation of these proteins, but also their molecular interactions, such as RNA binding or interaction with other proteins, even their localization, and for example, also their degradation by, by the proteasome or ubiquitin uh, um, uh, or autophagy system. Um, and so um, what we have studied so far, and what I will briefly uh, show you in a few slides is a bit of um, uh, how, um, on, on arginine methylation of FUS, um, which is altered in disease and also phosphorylation of TDP. So these are the two known disease-linked altered post-translation modifications, which yeah, show an altered pattern in disease. So um, the other PTMs um, I think are also very interesting and we want to look more into them. But so far, it's not necessarily known that they are um, altered in disease. So this is something to further look into. But yeah, so these two that I'll be talking about are the two uh, modifications that are already known to, to be altered in the disease state. And therefore, we are uh, very interested in them. So what we found um, already a few years ago is that in patients that have these FUS aggregates, what you always see is that its arginine methylation is lost. So FUS is normally methylated on its RTG motifs in, in all tissues and in cells uh, that you look at, but in the um, uh, affected brain regions of these patients, so the, the, the frontal cortex uh, in these FPD patients, you actually do find FUS in an unmethylated state. So this we could show based on uh, modification-specific antibodies that we raised. FUS basically loses its normal uh, asymmetric dimethylation pattern and yeah, becomes unmethylated through so far unknown mechanisms. So this is something we also still need to, to find out uh, where a lot of this modification comes from. What we have um, so far focused on in or what we are currently studying is the consequences of this. Um, so how the behavior of the protein is altered when the modification is lost. And we have already shown that its phase separation seems to be promoted when the modification um, is lost. So we compared using in vitro methylation, um, methylated versus unmethylated FAS in various phase separation assays. Um, um, also quantitative assays, but I just show you um, to illustrate what we saw this, this droplet assay. You see that unmethylated FUS has a higher tendency to phase separate. And in FRAP assays, for example, we could show that these condensates are less dynamic. Um, so we think that loss of these modifications, as you find it in disease, is a well, could be one factor that promotes FUS aggregation or aberrant phase separation of FUS. And what we are currently looking in, and this is work of Erin um, Sternberg in my lab, she's studying RNA binding of FUS and has um, observed that uh, most likely also RNA binding of FUS is altered when uh, this modification is lost. So this is an illustrated EMSA um, with a, the FUS known fast target RNA. So it's an RNA that was um, um, yeah, described by Fred Alain's lab to be a specific RNA target engaging both its RRM motif and the zinc finger. And so um, in between the zinc finger and RRM, you have uh, an RVG region. And so um, uh, what Erin sees is that um, binding to this specific RNA is, is altered, seems to be reduced when, uh, when the protein lacks this, uh, the methylation mark. So this is again comparing methylated versus um, in vitro methylated versus unmethylated FUS. And so we are uh, very interested in following this up more in more detail, for example, using fluorescence assays with the Lemke lab at the IMB or the Julian Koenig lab to um, look at this more globally using uh, in vitro clip. And so uh, we think that loss of this modification not only alters phase separation of FAS, but also um, its RNA binding uh, properties. And um, that could also be a pathological factor. Um, and very briefly, just in the last two more slides, I want to mention that um, interesting data that we have now um, in a manuscript and bioarchive on TDP phosphorylation. So this is another well-known uh, um, disease-linked post-translation modification. Um, so this 
modification you always find in all ALS and FTD patients. You always see a hyperphosphorylated form of TDP and the serines that get phosphorylated are located in the C-terminal or complexity domain of TDP. And so far it was completely unknown um, what effect that has on um, TDP phase separation and aggregation. And uh, Lara Grusa Silva, a PhD student in my lab, um, recently tackled this uh, using in vitro uh, phosphorylation of TDP and making phosphomimetic versions of this protein. So she introduced either five or 12 different uh, phosphomimetic mutations. Um, and also in vitro phosphorylation assays, she observed this phenotype. She basically saw that um, the more phosphocytes you have, the less the protein tends to phase separate and aggregate. And also in um, assays in cells, where we look at stress granule recruitment of um, either the wild type protein versus phosphomimetic version, you see that having these phosphomimetic mutations actually basically yeah, suppresses uh, TDP stress granule recruitment and keeps the protein dispersed in the cytoplasm. And so <clears throat> sort, of, sort of in contrary to what we and probably many others also expected is that having uh, these phospho groups on TDP43, so this, you know, the, 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 uh, what, what you see in the disease state doesn't actually promote TDP aggregation, but it um, counteracts TDP aggregation and, and sort of leads to rather a dispersed, more liquid-like phenotype and, and uh, solubility of TDP. And so we proposed um, in this recent work that this might be a cellular response um, that comes up uh, in cells uh, as, as a mechanism to compensate, um, uh, basically to counteract TDP aggregation and sort of an attempt to solubilize the protein and uh, prevent its aggregation. And so we're very interested in finding out how this is regulated in cells and at what stage it arises uh, in the disease process and whether this is indeed a, um, um, yeah, um, a tackling tool, how one could uh, solubilize TDP or how one could keep TDP, make TDP more soluble. Okay, so with this, I'm at the end of my talk. I hope I could give you a bit of um, uh, overview of, of the work we do, um, and the basic mechanisms, um, how we think these disease-linked proteins sort of mislocalize and aggregate, and about uh, our recent regulating mechanisms we found that could potentially um, yeah, reverse this process um, and yeah, restore the physiological nuclear localization. And with this, I, I end and thank my fantastic team. So um, I have to admit that this is a still an outdated uh, picture from pre-COVID times because we didn't actually manage to take a, a recent group picture here at uh, after our move to, to Mainz. So this is something that I will have to do very soon. Uh, so I mentioned some of the work um, of the people that, um, that are listed here are in, in the picture. Uh, we also have fantastic collaborators on these projects or also he, uh, now more recently locally in Mainz um, uh, at the IMB and uh, these are funding sources. And yeah, I um, wanna also mention that uh, Mainz is a very nice, uh, beautiful place on the Rhine River. And uh, if you're interested in like disease, disease, disease um, relevant research on, on RNA binding proteins, um, consider joining our team. So we have a postdoc position available, especially for people with a proteomics background. Uh, feel free to reach out, um, contact me. And I'm happy to answer your questions either now or later in the Discord channel. Thank you, Dorothy, for the very nice talk. Uh, we already have uh, here two questions. Uh, let me start with the one for, from uh, Stephanie Richard. She asked whether the loss of FOS uh, in LAS is, uh, using antibodies can be the result of the loss of the epitope, um, for instance, folding or SMDA or MNA rather than ADMA. Uh, okay, yes, I, I see what you mean. Um... So I, I think it's unlikely because um, I mean, we also see, you know, that it's simply a, a technical issue because we, I mean, we also see it um, a lot of in, in Western blood in, when we work with denatured protein. And uh, so we see this, uh, this phenotype, not only with one particular antibody, but for example, also if we use an antibody that is specific to unmethylated FUS, 
doesn't stain in the normal state, but then the staining is only present in the disease state. So therefore, yeah, I'm pretty confident that this is not just due to a, a loss of the epitope. Can I, can um, I just add, uh, it, I mean, do you see, hello, do you see, hello. A, do you see a reduction in PRMT1, for example, uh, if you look, because perhaps, um, I mean, we see these with these, these type one inhibitors that the SDMA increases. And so of course your antibodies would have difficulty. Ah, okay. So you mean, yeah, okay. You mean S, like there's SDMA. A, there's a reduction yes. in PRMT1 rather than demethylation because we don't know of any demethylates. Um, yes, true. I mean, so it's true that the, the symmetric um, yeah, that's uh, what methylation. We we haven't managed to raise a like an antibody to it, and so yeah. that's um, something we haven't um, addressed. Look at that. Yes. Yeah, I'm not working on that, so you could. Yeah. Um, so it's um, that's a possibility that we have a yeah. So therefore, I, I agree with you that we I probably should be cautious in calling it a hypomethylation or a loss of yeah. methylation. So we definitely do find staining or you know recognition yeah. with this unmethyl specific yeah. antibody but yeah it's true that in addition and also um monomethyl um specific yeah. antibody also does recognize um the inclusions so that's uh, also published but yeah so we haven't addressed whether there is a switch to a, a more like sdma form yeah, that's still a possibility and yeah as, as yeah, i agree with you that it's not clear how you know how the, this this altered modification Rises. Thank you, and I just will uh, read quickly the last uh, question. And if there are more, uh, I will propose that we continue in the Discord because um, we are running a bit out of time. So um, the f it's the question is from Raul Dobby, and he and um, he or she asks what might be the possible causes of demethylation of our arginine residues in FOS and whether there is a, an upregulation of TMPO1 that can positively affect neurodegeneration. Yeah, I mean, regarding the first question, uh, indeed, um, it's not known, so we can only speculate. Um, so as Stefan said, you know, no demethylases uh, are really known for RNA binding proteins. Um, so, um, it's not really clear, so it could be. Um, uh, I rather think that it's a, not not an active demethylation, but maybe a, um, a reduction in the levels of PRMT1 activity, something of PRMT8 activity, which are the two methylating enzymes. But yeah, this is something really to 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 be to be shown. So it's purely speculative. So we don't have evidence for this. That could be that can be speculated. And the second, regarding the second question, um, so in Drosophila models of FAS, it has indeed been shown that overexpression of transpatin or the ortholog of transpatin does ameliorate neurodegeneration and have a sort of, yeah, positive effect. Um, so therefore, I think it's a, indeed a, um, a viable concept that elevating the levels of these nuclear input receptors can be protective or positive, uh, protective in neuro against neurogeneration. Makes sense. Um, yeah, I, I will invite you to probably answer the uh, another question that is in the chat. Um, yes, I can do that. Even directly in the chat. Uh, and Julian, uh, please feel free to <laughs> introduce our next speaker. Thank you for, thank you for the very nice talk there, team. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot also from my side. Uh, so yeah, our next speaker will be uh, René Ketting. Uh, he's a director at the Institute of Molecular Biology. Uh, yeah, his uh, main research interest lies in small RNA, or at least one of his <laughs> research interests lies in small RNA biology. And uh, with a focus on the model systems, C. Elegant, C. elegans and zebrafish. And yeah, I'm very much looking forward uh, to your talk. And thanks for joining us. Thanks, Julian, for uh, see. Okay. Okay. So 
Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. I've seen already quite some familiar names in the audience. Um, welcome to our um, um, collaborative seminar um, session here. Uh, today, I want to talk about a project um, that has been developed over the past years and deals with small RNA inheritance. And in fact, it also touches quite a bit on um, um, phase separation, what, so what Dorothe also just, just spoke about. So what you see here is a uh, structure of, a, of an argonaut protein, which is you know, the central molecule of, in small RNA research. Um, and here on the right, I depicted, uh, just aim to uh, identify, of course, when we reproduce and when other species reproduce, the DNA is extremely important um, uh, for, for that process. Uh, but we know also about small RNAs that are being transmitted. Um, although I would um, say maybe not as much in mammals yet, uh, but that, uh, who knows, that may change. Um, so just to get everybody on the same page uh, regarding small RNA biology, a very small introduction. Um, as I said, argonaut proteins are central molecules uh, in these pathways and they bind, they, they use small RNA molecules indicated by this little red line here as sequence specific guides to identify their targets. Here I identified in blue. Here you see a crystal structure of this from the, from the Patel lab from um, the uh, earlier days. Um, and it's really this combination of argonaut protein with a small RNA recognizing a target that then triggers a gene regulatory effect, which can be translation, inhibition, um, stability of the RNA. Some of the argonaut proteins are actually endonucleases. Um, and it can also have effect on chromatin. Now, there are many different argonaut proteins around. Um, we find them in many, many different species, ranging from archaeobacteria to unicellular eukaryotes to mammals and also plants. Um, in fact, research in plants was, was one of the main driving forces in, in, in the early days of small RNA biology, and, and it still is. Um, and in all these systems, these argonaut proteins play essential roles in one way or the other. We have a particular interest in the germline. Um, and this family right here in, uh, at the bottom of the tree is the peewee-like family. And this is a, um, an animal-specific argonaut group, which is um, specifically expressed in the germline, where it has an important role in regulating transposable elements. Now, uh, the organism of this um, seminar will be C. elegans, which you see here, a little nematode. And in C. elegans, actually, there is a sort of specific, worm-specific argonaut group, um, which is also heavily enriched in the germline um, and is found as the worm, as, as the worm, as the word in, implies, uh, specifically found in nematodes. Uh, and also here, these Wago proteins, uh, one of their roles is the control of transposable elements. However, of course, being expressed in a germline gives opportunities in the sense of transmitting small RNA-mediated gene regulation across generation and using small RNAs to, to prime gene expression in the next gen generation. And indeed, uh, research has shown that this, uh, that this, that this can happen. Um, for instance, I just put two uh, relatively recent um, uh, snapshots of paper titles here, one from the lab of uh, Colleen Murphy, one from Odette Gashavi, who have both uh, con contributed a lot of interesting research on, on how RNA, small RNA-mediated inheritance can contribute to C. elegans biology. In one case, transmitting the information on recognizing pathogens. And in another case, for instance, um, inheriting small RNAs related to behavior, actually uh, originally coming from neuronal cells. But this inheritance phenotype has actually been observed quite some time back. Um, so this is a paper from the lab of Andrew Fire. Um, I would assume very well known for his uh, co-discovery together with uh, Craig Mello, of course, of RNA interference in the first place. And they found already quite early on that RNA interference, when you induce that in C. elegans with double-stranded RNA, can be inherited quite effectively. And in this particular paper, 
they noted that, um, at least in some cases, it is actually more effective through the male gametic line, um, which may be counterintuitive if you think about you know, how, how small germ cells are. Um, of course, things can be transmitted also via chromatin, but um, also the thinking was already then that some, some cytoplasmic material may be um, contributed to the, to the offspring. Now, these are all exogenous examples of inheritance. Um, we have a few years ago, back-to-back uh, -back with the uh, lab of Karen and Phillips, um, also identified the importance of inheritance of small RNA um, uh, mediated gene regulation in a, um, as a, in, a, in a completely endogenous setting. So what I depict here is a, is a cross. Um, this is, these are all wild type an animals and of course, you know, there's no sterility usually associated. And I just want to show the, the black words here indicate that these pathways are functional. Now in C. elegans, strikingly, the, you can actually mutate many of these small RNA pathways as indicated here in, by the red lettering. Um, and I, I've you know, chosen to simplify this quite a bit because it's quite com complex. Um, but actually the worms can do quite well without these small RNA pathways. There are problems on the long term, but acute sterility is not um, one of the one of the phenotypes. However, problems do arise um, if you allow animals to make endogenous SI RNAs, which are also known as 22G RNAs, um, but without any input from their parents. At least, you know, no input in terms of small RNAs. So here, uh, dad and mom are both not proficient in providing small RNAs of these pathways. And here, the offspring starts to make SI RNAs against genes that actually should be expressed and get sterility. And this is known as the mutator-induced sterility phenotype. And I think it's, it's an intriguing example of how small RNA inheritance is helping, um, you know, to, to keep small RNA populations on target. In C. elegans. Now we took this one step further and now asked now can um, our maternal or paternal small RNA is now sufficient uh, to rescue this sterility phenotype? And indeed, um, so this, this blue bar here, I will show a couple of these graphs also later on. This blue bar here indicates this sterility phenotype, so a problem. And in this cross here, we allowed the mother to make small RNAs. Um, and you can completely rescue this sterility phenotype. And also if you just provide it via the father. Um, so it's really, you can, um, small RNAs from either the mother or the father are sufficient to, uh, to contribute to this epigenetic inheritance phenotype. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. Now, inheritance via the cytoplasm of the oocyte would be sort of expected. You know, the, cyt the oocyte is, of course, big, but sperm cytoplasm is actually quite little in volume. And during spermatogenesis, there is this process of cytoplasmic elimination. And in C. elegans, this stage sort of looks like this. You have this sort of dumbbell structure where this residual body forms. And this residual body collects a lot of the cytoplasmic material that is no longer needed within sperm ending up with these very small sper spermatids. And so what um, Jan Schreier set out to do in the group is ask, you know, can there be inheritance of cytoplasmic small RNAs via these small um, sperm cells, knowing that a lot of the material is actually discarded during the uh, spermatogenesis process. Now, Jan was looking at Wago 3 one of these you know, nematode-specific argonaut proteins, and one of the first things that he noticed was not, was in principle not very surprising. He found it expressed in the germline. So this is the germline of C. elegans. Um, germline differentiation goes in this direction and here you get oocytes forming. But already early on he noted there is expression in this structure right here, which is the spermatheca. And here mature sperm is being stored. And the expression levels of Wago 3 here are really high. It's easily visible under a dissecting microscope. Now, um, in early stages, you see these foci, and these are P granules. So here you see an enlarged image of that section. Um, there's a very nice overlap with PEGL1. Um, but it's also known that PEGL1 actually, and the P granules actually disappear during spermatogenesis. 
And this is shown in this example right here where you see a spermatogenic gonad. So here this, this upper part of the image is gone and the cells differentiate from left to right. Um, Pego one is again in magenta and you see it present here in early stages, but then in later stages, like here, Pego one disappears. And it, that has been described before and components of these P granules actually end up in these residual bodies, which are indicated here in this, in this yellow circle right here. Now, WAGO3 behaves differently. Uh, WAGO3 is in the peak granules in the beginning, but then here starts to leave. And you can see that on the right here in the sort of a quant quantification uh, plot, um, it starts to leave the peak granules and joins other cytoplasmic granules. And these granules maintain uh, to be present in the spermatids, as you can show and see right here. Now, this, this is all quite crowded, hard to see. So Jan also dissected um, cells from a spermatogenic gonad and looked at the different stages. And you can clearly see, for instance, in this stage right here, that this residual body is really devoid of WAGO3 signal. So WAGO3 is really specifically kept out of this residual body and so that it can be um, actually present in mature sperm. And sure enough, if you uh, remove WAGO3 from the male, that, that is this line right here, males lose their ability to contribute to this rescue of mutator-induced sterility. In other words, males lose their ability to transmit uh, small RNA-mediated epigenetic information. In the female, WAGO3 is not re required. But then we set out to ask, you know, what is, you know, how does WAGO3 uh, end up in mature sperm? And here we got a good, um, uh, push from an IP mass spectrometry experiment where we IP WAGO3 and we, I, we identify this protein P1. It's just on the border of significance here, but it proves to be very significant for uh, the project. So P1 is a project, is a, is a protein that has a B to B back domain and its N terminus, uh, which is a known protein protein interaction domain, and a C terminal part, which is largely disordered. And P1 is actually only expressed during this late stage of spermatogenesis. So this is again, such a spermatogenic gonad going from left to right. And P1 is only expressed in these very late stages in these foci that are also positive for WAGO3. You don't see the co-localization here, but believe me, these, 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 these things overlap perfectly. Um, and also in this, you know, this dumbbell stage, uh, uh, residual body forming um, stages, you see that the residual bodies are empty and WAGO3 and P1 are present in these granules. And we call these granules now P granules uh, for paternal epigenetic inheritance. And of course also P1 is named after that. Um, interestingly, P1 is very specific. So in early stages, um, like here in, in the gonad, also different argonaut proteins are being expressed, but only WAGO3 um, is and ends up in mature sperm and not in the residual body. So this is WAGO3. And this is an example where you see WAGO1. You see WAGO1 ends up mostly in the residual body and we see hardly any signal in the, um, in the mature sperm, indicating that WAGO3 is preferably segregated into mature sperm. And we could show if you take out P1, this is a P1 deletion, this bottom panel here, then WAGO3 assumes this phenotype like with what we see for WAGO1, for instance. It's no longer segregated into the mature sperm, but is found back in the residual body. And sure enough, like WAGO3, P1 is required in the male and only in the male for epigenetic in inheritance. So how are P granules kept within sperm then? Just let's, let's shift the question one step uh, further. But for that, I have to introduce you a little bit into um, C. elegans spermatogenesis and introduce a, an intriguing organelle that is, that is found in this cell type, which is called the fibrous body membranous organelle, or FBMO. It starts out as just a membranous organelle. It's, it derives from the Golgi. Um, it looks like this. It has this sort of blob, which has contents that are used um, during fertilization. There's a proteinaceous color here, and then there's these membranous blabs. And in later stages, um, this fibrous body forms, and this sort of 
bound by the membranous organelle by these membranous arms. Um, even in later stages, these, these organelles are sorted specifically in spermatids. Um, and actually the membranous arms start to be a bit more loose, uh, start to retract a little bit. One stage further, the fibrous body material has basically been um, released and you end up with this octopus-like structure, I call it. And then finally, in the mature spermatozoan, um, these structures do things that, that, I, that I'm not going to talk about. Uh, now it's known that this sorting process, especially at this stage right here, the budding spermatid, depends on myosin six, um, um, a, a specific myosin six protein called P15. And sure enough, also the pay granules that you see here again uh, in the wild type depend on P15 to be rescued from the residual body. So this suggests that pay granules at least use the same type of sorting machinery compared to the FBMOs. Now to look at this a bit in a bit more detail, um, we turn to correlation light electron microscopy um, in collaboration with the EMA, EMBL here in Heidelberg, which is uh, almost you know, just around the corner, I would say. Um, now just to uh, bring you back to these different stages that I introduced you um, already, here you see them in the EM at the bottom. And here, so this is the membranous organelle. These are sort of these arms. And this is this head. Here you see a nice example where you have the fibrous body formed and this octopus head with his arms completely around this fibrous body. Um, here, for instance, you have um, uh, clearly a structure that is releasing the fibrous body ma material. And here, the spermatid, you see this yeah, this octopus uh, that has no fibrous body associated with it anymore. Now, and when we overlay the pay granule signals, these are always associated with or right next to the membranous organelles. Um, and we actually think that they are associated with these membranous arms uh, that, that are right here, as you can see here, for example. Um, and this is the Wago 3 signal. The pay one signal is completely the same. So we think actually that, that, that the pay granules are docking on these FBMO or organelles that are uh, already being sorted into the spermatids. So how do we think that these pay granules now look like? Um, sort of a, like a schematic representation here, where we have pay one, uh, the B2B back domain is known to oligomerize. Um, we have not shown this ourselves, it's from the lab of Tanya Mitak. Um, and we could show that the Wago 3 protein is attracted to the pay granules by the intrinsically disordered parts of pay one um, And interestingly enough, the intrinsically disordered regions of pay one themselves are, are not really needed to form these granules. So the granules may be largely formed based on this oligomerization um, of this folded domain. But then again, how do pay granules then um, associate with these FPMOs? I mean, Again, we shift the question one level. And again, IP mass spec um, helped us out here and we did IP on pay one, as you can see nicely enriched here. And we identified the protein, apologies for the boring worm names, but this one is called pay two. Um, it actually looks a lot like pay one. Uh, it also has a B2B and back domain. The C-terminal IDR is a lot shorter. Um, and it's expressed very similar to actually almost identical compared to pay one. Uh, you can see that here in this stage, where basically you can see a perfect co-localization between pay one and pay two. Wherever the one is, you find the other. Now in pay two mutants, we get a very interesting phenotype. Um, and this looks a lot like what we see in this myosin six mutant. Remember this, this mutant that is defective in segregating these FBMO organelles from the residual body into the spermatid. And we see a very similar phenotype. Uh, we see many foci remaining here in the residual body. Um, and in addition, we also see fewer pay granules um, in total. And in pay two mutants, again, this is this you know, complex phenotype that I try to explain. Um, pay two mutants are also required in the male for inheritance. So this shows that you know, just having pay granules is not enough. You need to actually segregate the pay granules into these spermatids in order to be functional. And I think there's pretty good evidence to show that you really need these cytoplasmic 
pay granules with an argonaut protein um, to mediate this epigenetic inheritance. Then um, the last shift that I will try to make is then how does pay 2 uh, mediate the association to the FBMOs? Right? I mean, this is I'm just sort of relaying things um, bit by bit, but we still don't know how things are really connected. And I'm afraid we still don't, you know, we don't have like a 100% proof answer, but I think we have a good, a uh, very good indication. And for that, I need to introduce to you a protein called P10, uh, which is a palmitoyl transferase. So adds palmitic acid tails, long um, hydrophobic tails to proteins. And P10 is actually found on these FBMOs, these organelles that uh, on which we find our uh, pay granules. Um, so this is wild type, a primary spermatocyte, where you just see the pay granules as I described before, and the budding spermatid. This is all um, nothing new here. In the speed 10 mutant, we already see early on um, defects in pay granules. Um, they, they, they cluster together very quickly. Uh, we have not been able to sort of catch, you know, uh, periods in time where, where, where it would still look relatively normal. Um, and this big aggregate all gets uh, get, uh, segregated out into the residual body, as you can see here in this bottom, bottom panel here. Um, and we actually think that P2 itself is modified by, P, uh, by uh, SP10. Um, and so this is uh, what I show you here. So this is a Western blot. So this is a Western blot looking at P2 uh, tagged with an HA tag. And what we see in wild type uh, is consistently these two bands. And this is for this. This would be very con consistent with the permutation of of a protein of of that size. And in speed ten mutants, which is the last lane, um, we find that this upper band is completely gone. Um, or completely, I mean, yeah. Um, and so we think that P two is actually um, a substrate of speed ten, uh, and speed ten may put on the palmitic acid tail on P two in order to keep P two and thereby the whole P granules attached to these uh, membranous arms of the pay granules. Now you also see this, this middle lane here. This is um, something that we didn't expect at all. Uh, this is a pay one mutant. So here we have, we still have the palmitoalase. Um, we have uh, pay two. And in a pay one mutant, we actually seem to get more of the palmitoalation. We don't know what the relevance is, uh, but we know that we, we see that pay one itself may also be modified. So we see this, this smear upwards always very consistently. And this smear depends actually on P2. So we think that this smear is some form of modification, possibly also permatoalation, but could also be something else. Um, but that may happen, that may uh, be uh, introduced onto P1 uh, actually um, depending on the presence of P2. So we interpret that as meaning would be put on P1 on the FBMOs. Um, However, it's not SP10. So in, in SP10, this signal is still, <clears throat> is still present. So it would be a different type of modification enzyme uh, that would need to do this. So what, how do we think it's, things look now? Uh, further evolved model. Uh, so we have the pay granule. We have pay one and pay two. I didn't show you, but we know that pay one and pay two can interact with each other via the B2B back domains. Um, we think that pay two is permitoalated, and then that provides a link to the fibrous body membranous organelles. And that is how WAGO3 is uh, being kept on these organelles and then is sorted into uh, sperm. And we think actually that forming on this organelle, maybe with other enzymes there also, other permutoalation events or other modifications may actually be added to, to P1. Um, the function of that, we currently don't know yet. But finally, a model at the cellular level, so what I've um, tried to tell you is that, so in naive germ cells or in, in spermatogenesis, um, in naive sperm spermatocytes, um, WAGO3 is present in P granules, which is you know, a very well-known, well-described general germ granule. Um, during spermatogenesis, however, these P granules disassemble and they disappear and most of the contents disappear into the residual body. Um, WAGO3 also leaves the P granules, but WAGO3 is specifically absorbed in the, these pay granules. And these pay granules are attached to specific organelles 
via permeter relation anchor, um, via per permeter wheel anchor, we think. Um, and that keeps Wago 3 in this permitted and prevents it from getting out. And of course, later when you think this through, um, in order for Wago 3 to have an effect in the oocyte or in the embryos, of course, there needs to be some mechanism for Wago 3 release again. Um, and this is something that we are, that's one of the things that we are currently studying in the group. And with that, I come to the end. Um, I thanked, I mentioned Jan already, who was the main driver of this project. Uh, got a lot of help from Svenja though in the lab and from Anne-Sophie with who analyzed small RNA sequencing data, which I didn't talk about. Uh, big thanks to the EMBL for their CLEM expertise, um, to the group of Falk Buter and Sabrina Dietz at the IMB from MASPEC, and for the groups of Carolyn Phillips and Steve Lano for expertise on um, germ granules and spermatogenesis in C. elegans. And with that, um, I'm done and I would be happy to take uh, any questions? Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot uh, for your talk, Rene. Um, yeah, if you have questions, please type in the chat. Maybe I, I start with one. I wondered, I know what sequences are loaded. Yeah, I, I basically had a little bit a similar question. So there is a question: What sequences are loaded into uh, paternal hmm. Vago threes? Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. Um, so we sequenced uh, by, by Wago 3 from um, uh, both male and female. Not a whole lot of difference. Um, I would say actually very little difference between uh, the male and female. There's a lot of transposons being hit. Uh, interestingly, one of the transposons that I studied during my PhD, TC3, um, is not bound by TC3 anymore in the male, whereas it is in, in other stages. I'm not sure what that's what the relevance that is um but so what we have not done yet and i think we should do that at some point um is to really sequence wago 3 ips from uh, spermatids uh, because so far we have sequenced males and you know we have the whole spermatogenesis process there and it may be dominated by you know species that are expressed er early on rather than species that actually are loaded into into sperm but that, that we haven't done yet mm -hmm. Um, then uh, there is uh, the question, uh, is PAY1, PAY2 required for HDRD1 or WAGO4 inheritance system? No, so those, those two, at least in our hands, um, I mean, in, sp in specific settings, we, can, we, we also see effects of um, HDRD1 uh, in the male, not for WAGO4, it's just not expressed there. And PAY1 and PAY2 is really, I think they're one of the most male specific genes that, that, that we have, at least we have ever seen. Uh, so it's, it's really male specific, um, no effect on oocytes whatsoever. Maybe one question as a follow up on, on the first one. So when you don't have Vago 3, what, what small RNAs are then produced in these offspring so when you don't have these so what that, that's what we did before um, so we, you, we get small rnas that are really targeting genes that are you know normally expressed in the germline uh, you know you you name it uh, and it's uh, bound to be tar targeted and we know that these small rnas are then actually bound by um rd1 <laughs> as was just mentioned um and um, that that protein then triggers the silencing of these genes. Um, so it's, it's really erroneous targeting that leads to this sterility uh, thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then question from Svetlana. Hi, <laughs> do, you, do you know the palmutilation site on PAY2 and, <laughs> and did you mutate something or? Yeah, um, actually, um, so there is, a, 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 I mean, I've read different things. So there's, there are sites that give predicted permutation sites. Um, there is, there's an excellent site in PAY2 and the N-terminus. We mutated that one, it has no effect. <laughs> um, but um, we actually, so we, we have to, to dig deeper there because I've also seen sites where actually people say, well, you know, it's very hard to predict which cysteine is being picked. And it could well be like with ubiquitilation, 
you know, if you mutate a lysine, it just picks the next, next lysine. Uh, and there are definitely more cysteines available. Um, and we know, at least for PAY1, that this C-terminal IDR does seem to contact these FBMOs um, based on our experiments. I don't have time to go into it. So it's, um, I think it may be more in the IDR region in the end than in the predicted N-terminal site. But, uh, but yeah, it's definitely something we would love to have, of course. Yes, site-specific mutation there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think maybe, I don't know, uh, Mariella, maybe we move it then to the <laughs> Discord, the discussion, or I, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. Maybe you can introduce that again, or before that, I, I thank maybe everybody for joining our speakers, also the help from the IMB administration uh, and so on. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. And maybe Mariella, you can have then the final yeah, yeah, and um, just invite you to the next session. Uh, uh, in uh, two weeks, we will have the University of Rochester, and um, I will. Um, uh, we can we can continue the discussion in the in the Discord for fifteen minutes. Uh, please join, and, and you can find the information on, on the chat. Um, uh, if and if and yeah, we we see each other again. <laughs> Um, in a, in, a, in two weeks, uh, I hope you enjoyed the, these presentations. Um, thanks for joining us again. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay.